Okay. It, so it's a problem that affects one in five Australians <coughs> under the age of 65, and one in three, and sometimes more, once you get above 65, unfortunately. So it's a problem that touches many of our lives. And if you suffer from it, or you know someone who suffers from it, you know what terrible um, uh, sadness and suffering inflicts on people, and how it takes away the quality of life, and just makes life, normal life, so much harder to live. And it's that um, uh, devastation that it causes that's really attracted me to work with it, and try and understand it, and to help people suffer from it. I have family members that also suffer from it, so it just isn't purely professional. Um, it's uh, now thought it's been, chronic pain is a problem that, um, this definition has changed over the, over the years, it's, it's been evolving as, as new scientific advances and uh, theories come out, and um, as you can see by the title of the talk, the uh, role of the brain in pain is becoming pretty important now and um, changing the way we think about it and also the way we approach it. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, uh, the idea that you can change your brain, change your pain. And so I'm going to show you a process tonight um, whereby you can do that as best I can. Um, there won't be a lot of time to show you in depth the skills of that process, but I'll, I will demonstrate some of them to you to give you an idea of how it works. Okay, so we'll be talking about what kind of a problem pain is, how pain gets into your brain, uh, the idea that pain is a memory, how pain memories can be changed. We'll also look at some key principles that principles about how your brain works, so that um, you are going to learn a bit about how you work, um, and the way that if you're fixing a motor car, you need to know how it works in order to be able to repair it, otherwise you're just flying blind. And it's the same with the brain and with pain, there's a lot of ideas, but really if we know, if we know how the brain works, then we can develop strategies that work with how the brain works, rather than how we think the brain works. Of course, understanding the brain is still very much in its infancy, <coughs> and we have a lot more to learn. But we're, we are getting to a stage where we can say a few things about that. And then I'll show you um, a range of strategies to harness you know, your brain's ability to change. Real strategies, scientifically backed strategies. Right. And that'll give you um, a, set, a system and a set of tools that you can work with, some of which may be familiar, some of which will be new. So first of all, we'll start by just quickly defining what we mean when we think about pain. Um, pain, of course, started out as, a, as the idea of a physical problem. We all know the idea that you know, if you cut yourself or break a leg, you, um, you know, the nerve endings send a signal to your brain. That, that kind of pain is pretty well accepted and understood that's called acute pain. But chronic pain is a, is a much uh, different kind of thing. It involves um, the uh, emotions and perceptions. And since, since the 70s, um, pain has been redefined as, as something that involves emotional experience, which may or may not be associated with tissue damage. So the expert, pain experts are, are recognizing that it's not just uh, what we think of when we think of acute pain. Although I think for most of us in the room, that is really how we think of pain. And in some ways, when we talk about chronic pain, it's misleading because pain is only <coughs> one dimension of the problem. There is so many other things going on. There's genetic factors, there's psychological factors, and there's uh, changes in the brain. So, um, in the last decade or so, the role of the brain in pain has become a uh, topic of great interest in research and the uh, pain experts are increasingly defining pain as a neurodegenerative disorder. Now that sounds awful, it's not meant to imply that you have mad cow disease or something like that, but that there are a lot of things happening in your brain um, uh, of a damaging nature that are maintaining your pain. 
even, even though you feel as though you know, you're, you're sensing it in your body. So how does pain get into your brain? As, as I said, the first thing is no perception. Um, that's the traditional theory of pain. The second thing that uh, uh, sets the scene for pain, if you like, is stress. So if you've, if you've had a lot of stress in your life, or you've been in a motor vehicle accident or a stressful situation, you're much more at risk of developing chronic pain following an illness or an injury because your system is already weakened. Stressed people have biochemical abnormalities, psychological, we they're different, their immune system is affected, so they're more vulnerable to chronic pain. Right? So anyone who's had an accident or a major illness or an injury is more at risk of chronic pain if they have had that experience plus stress. And stress isn't just um, getting sick or having an, an accident, an injury. It can be, it can really go back to our childhood and the relationship we have with our parents and how secure um, the emotional bond was. So you can see there the picture of the man holding his baby wife on the telephone. Nothing terrible in that in itself. But that baby is, there's no eye contact and the baby's looking away and he's sort of, looking a little bit spaced out. And if that happens repetitively, and if that is a theme of that parent's interaction with that child, that child's going to grow up with a kind of emotional detachment from its own <coughs> self and its own needs. And we know that attachment disorders affect up to 50% of the normal population, and they are twice as prevalent in chronic pain sufferers. Because they, they uh, just tend to be uh, more hardworking, more put others first and themselves second. And those things, again, set the ground for chronic pain. So the um, best thing you can do to, to avoid chronic pain, which is probably too late if you're here, is to have a good, a good, a good secure attachment <coughs> with your parents. But that's not the only risk factor. There are many other risk factors. I'm just talking about stress. So as Melzack, who's one of the leading pain authorities in the world said um, over a decade ago, stresses have a destructive effect on your body, on the muscle, on the skeletal and hippocampal tissue, which may become the immediate basis of pain or provide a basis for the devastating effects of later minor injuries in which the severity of pain is disproportionately greater than would be expected from the pain, from the injury. So I'm going to show you three ways in which stress changes your brain's functioning, which, which um, lead to pain. The first is that chronic stress causes a series of biochemical changes, including um, decreased GABA. GABA is a neurotransmitter which keeps kind of everything in balance. Neuropenephrine, which provides energy. Um, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. BDNF is kind of, it's grow plus for your brain. It's, it's a substance that keeps the neurons uh, repaired and healthy in the brain. Uh, chronic, chronic stress also leads to decreased cortisol, which uh, causes increased inflammation. Uh, decreased endorphins, which increases your sensitivity to pain. And decreased dopamine, which affects your emotions, can make you feel numb and depressed, and to think more negatively and decreased serotonin, which affects your sleep and increases your fatigue. Now, in the early stages, these, these changes might be temporary, but if the stress goes on over a long time, the, the, these changes become sort of part of a permanent cycle that's self-perpetuating, and that person can experience fluctuations in their energy levels, in their mood, in their experience of their pain, which is quite independent of what's going on in their life. And that's all happening in their brain. Secondly, structurally, chronic pain sufferers have decreased grey matter. Okay, and, the, and especially in the hippocampus, grey matter is responsible for inflammation processing. So uh, a lot of chronic pain sufferers suffer from concentration and memory problems and just general problems in their thinking. They're, they're a bit, bit fuzzy. But, so that's 
they're losing grey matter at twice the rate associated with normal energy. <coughs> And lastly, um, mid, uh, chronic pain sufferers, uh, stressed people have an overactive default mode network. The default mode network is a circuit that runs between the thinking part of your brain, your frontal cortex, and the emotional part of your brain, which is areas of your brain and the anterior cingulate cortex and your amygdala. So I'm sure you've all, ex or some of you have experienced um, just feeling over uh, that you're overthinking and that your mind can't switch off and having trouble going to sleep because of that, that's your default mode network and overdrive. So you can think of your default mode network as your, as your worry network. And in chronic pain sufferers, it's an overdrive. So just to give you that little sample of brain changes that cause chronic pain, that's why scientists are starting to talk about it as a neurodegenerative disorder. Not that it's only in your brain, but that it's a big part of pain. And as you'll see, it's a part we can change. So we can, we can think of all those changes going on as like a memory. Right? Because there are change patterns of neural firing, there are biochemical changes, there are structural changes, there are functional changes. But the good news is, the good news from the idea of pain as a brain problem is that memories can be altered if you know how. And um, this is not a new idea, in fact. As long as go, as long as, go as 1934, uh, an a Spanish neuroscientist called Santiago Cajal uh, believed that the brain could be sculpted with the right stimulation. But they just didn't know how back then. Um, in 2000, uh, Eric Kandel won the Nobel Prize for demonstrating that brain changes, the brain changes in response to environmental stimulation. He did experiments with <coughs> sea slugs because that was the easiest thing to study, but it's now known that we can do this in humans. Some of you may have heard of Norman Doidge. He wrote a book called The Brain That Changes Itself, mm -hmm. and he's also written a book called The Brain That Heals Itself. He, he writes that about what's called neuroplasticity, that is the brain's ability to change itself. It's, the, it's what enables your brain to change its own structure and functioning in response to activity and mental experience. You do this all the time, it's part of living, but you're not conscious about how you're doing it. So you've all had an, you would have all had an experience of a memory being changed by a later experience. Perhaps a friend at school who betrayed you, or a boyfriend or a girlfriend who you uh, fell out of favour with and broke up with. At one point you had a certain feeling about that person or that situation. Something happened and then your feelings changed. So we do it, it's really part of living, this neuroplasticity. We just don't do it, you know how to do it consciously. It happens in <coughs> and the random living of everyday life. I also need to just point out that there are two types of memory. The memory is divided into two types. You have memory of uh, events. So that girl would go out remembering that her dad taught her how to ride a bike. That's called a, uh, a semantic memory. That's the memory of what happened. But she also will be developing a procedural memory which is the memory in the body of what happened. So that when she, when, she, you know, when she gets old, she can ride a bike without having to think about it anymore. Her muscles just know what to do. And um, chronic pain is really uh, a procedural memory. It's a memory that's in the body, it's in your, in your subconscious. It involves, of course, um, memories of events and circumstances, but it's primarily a procedural memory. So it's a, very, it's a special type of memory. And to change those kinds of memories, you need very specific experiences. So, as I said, you can change the brain if you know how it works. And I'm just going to give you Brain Science 101 tonight, okay? 
Um, so, so the first thing you need to know about your brain is that it's a hierarchical system. That means that it processes system information bottom up and top down. And it processes different information in each way. So it's bottom up information, the sensory experience, <coughs> sights, sounds, touch. It's, it's what enters your brain through your senses. Right? And top down information is cognitive information. It's thoughts, um, and memories of events, and expectations. And both types of information can affect what goes on very powerfully. But bottom up information probably has a bit more power to change how you feel than top down. So when we talk about this hierarchy, we think that the brain. Um, is, is processing in terms of senses first, and then feelings, and then at the top, thinking. Right? You, they both, of course, work together. Um, but they work in a particular way. So when you have a pleasant sensory experience, that's going to change your mood and it's going to change the way you think. Whereas if you're suffering, struggling with chronic pain or depression and you try to talk yourself out of it, that's hard because you're, you're, you're working from the top down and that's not really the way the information travels in your brain. So maybe some of you have had that experience of trying to sort of cheer yourself up and just finding it not easy when you're in that you know, negative emotional state. So this... this uh, the other thing is that um, your brain has your brain has only basically does two things and all that. At the end of the day, it pays attention to things it, and it decides what's worth remembering and what's not worth remembering. That's all your brains really do. Is that light too bright for you? Is that going to open? Oh, no, that's good. Where's the, the projector light? That's the, these lights. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to kill things, is it? Yeah, yeah. Right. the room will, you'll, everything will be dark besides the. Um, um, you want to sit down in the back? No, they're everywhere. Yeah. Don't worry about it. The thing, the thing about attention is, is also is that you have two types of attention. You have attention that you have external attention and internal attention. So right now you're listening to me talking and you're processing what I'm saying. That's external attention. But some of you might also be thinking, what's for dinner or what you're going to do later. That's internal attention. But generally speaking, ex any external stimuli is more attention grabbing than internal attention. So just follow that information away because it's going to come in handy a bit later. So, oh, right, so as I talked about, you have uh, four main types of input. You have thought, you have touch, you have sight, and you have sound. Okay, so just to, just to round up what I've said so far, uh, your, brain, your brain is a hierarchical system. It has two key functions, attention and memory. The best way to change memories is through bottom-up stimulation, such as sight, sound and touch. But the stimulus must be sufficiently interesting to attract your attention and alter brain activity. And that's the trick, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And then whatever you experience through your senses, has to be integrated with top-down processes for the learning to be maintained and integrated. I'm going to show you how that works in practical terms now. So, <coughs> so applying all this to pain, you have bottom-up, we'll start with bottom-up strategies, uh, top-down strategies. These are things like understanding feelings, so there's a saying in psychology, name it and tame it. One of the keys to regulating emotions is being able to identify them and express them. Mindfulness, which I'm sure you'd all be familiar with. OK, 
Okay, so the key, the key thing about mindfulness is that it's accepting your feelings in a non-judgmental way. Um, a positive cognition, a positive cognition in, in tonight's sense isn't meant to mean positive thinking, it's meant to mean new learning based on emotional experiences. So when you have an experience that makes you feel better or in control say, of your pain or your feelings, you develop, you develop what's called a positive cognition, which is a belief that you can cope, that you can control your feelings. So in this sense, it's, it's kind of a, um, a top-down interpretation of a bottom-up experience, as opposed to trying to force down the belief that you can cope and that you're okay. Because that doesn't work, because it's not based on anything felt. Right? Other cognitive strategies include things like imagery, and using uh, memories, past memories, to change the way you feel in the present. So, hopefully most of the people in this room went, remember where they went as a child for their holidays, and have happy memories of being carefree, and playing there, and feeling healthy and well, and <coughs> when, you, when you recall those memories, hopefully it brings back some, some sense of what you felt then. So the idea of memories is that memories aren't just of semantic things of what happened, they also involve feelings. Okay. Um, safety is just refers to the fact that um, if you are, we all probably have physical safety in this room, but safety also means having emotional safety and it means having safety from our symptoms and from what's going on in our life. So if we don't feel in control of, for example, chronic pain, then there's a, there's a lack of safety there because the pain could happen any time and we, uh, we don't know if we're going to be able to cope with it. So it's safety in that sense, not safety in the sense that you're going to get eaten by a lion or mugged or something. And lastly, in terms of top-down practices, spiritual beliefs and the practices, and I'm not just talking about you know, organized religion, but also um, just a belief system that helps the person to, to rise above you know, their current situation and suffering and to transcend what's happening in the present moment. Now, the bottom up strategies, oh, so just to finish, top down, so as I said, top down strategies are much more reliant on um, thinking, on the frontal cortex. Top bottom up strategies are much more immediate, much more intuitive much more natural, if you like, much more go with the flow. So there are things like touch. And I don't, by touch, I don't actually mean so much therapeutic massage or hugs, but um, specific <coughs> kinds of touch that change the way your brain's processing pain. So, for example, um, actually, I'll show you in a minute, I'll show you in a minute what I mean. But just to flag that it's not probably what you generally think of as touch. Exercise, I'm sure you'd all be familiar with that. It's a well-known stress management strategy. A thing called bilateral stimulation. Bilateral stimulation refers to alternating auditory or um, visual stimulation, which captures your attention and stimulates your relaxation response. Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit later show you how that works and what it is. Uh, other sensory strategies, so that could be things like um, uh, heat packs or listen to music or any, any other sensory thing that makes you feel real good. Sharing feelings, a very good stress management strategy because when, when we keep our feelings inside, it builds up stress physically in us. Whereas when we express our feelings to someone who cares, it releases tension. And lastly, sleep. So sleep is essential for well-being and physical health. Often a problem with chronic pain suffers. So both, and both um, bottom-up strategies and top-down strategies uh, talk to and work with each other. They're not independent. So what you experience uh, in your body through your senses affects how you think and how you think uh, affects how you feel. They're integrated. They, they can't be separated.
Okay, so I'm, gonna sh I'm just going to take you through three top-down strategies. Okay. So the first one is mindfulness meditation. So has anyone here done mindfulness training? Yeah. Yes. 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 Right. <coughs> so mindfulness involves, if you're suffering from chronic pain or any, any distress and emotion or feeling really, mindfulness involves basically just sitting with that feeling in a non-judgmental way, not fighting it, just accepting it, um, breathing into it, breathing out, and trying to allow oneself to get a bit of distance with that feeling. <coughs> mindfulness effectively strips out a lot of the emotional distress that's associated with chronic pain. So I'm not here to teach you mindfulness tonight, but just to mention it as a strategy. Mindfulness changes activity in all of the areas of the brain that are known to be involved in chronic pain. And so this is just a little map of those areas. Um, uh, the, um, the thalamus, which is the part of your brain where pain is, enters the brain and is relayed throughout your brain. And it's the only area, only the part of the brain that's actually dealing with pure sen sensation. All the other areas that are involved in pain are actually uh, areas of your brain that are also involved in processing emotion. So you've got your uh, somatosensory cortex, which is obviously where you feel pain. Your insula, which is the part of your brain that tells you how much pain you're, you're experiencing. Uh, your amygdala, which generates a fear response. The anterior cingular cortex, which sort of registers um, when something's happening that you don't like or or unexpected, and your frontal cortex, which is where you do your thinking. Okay, so as I talked about earlier, memory. So memory is um, the idea of just bringing back a memory of a uh, happy time that has strong emotional connotations associated with it. And thirdly, and um, Another type of imagery which has um, just come out fairly recently is, is um, to use images of your brain in pain and then your brain not in pain. And this comes from an American physician called Mos by the name of Moskowitz. And basically, he was injured in a boating accident and, and um, he wasn't getting any better using conventional therapies. So he studied uh, neuroplasticity in the brain and he, he develop two images of the brain. One of the brain in pain and one of the brain not in pain. And he set himself a goal of every time he experienced pain to look at those two images. Every time. Every time, without fail. And after three, three months or so, he was noticing a little bit of relief after three months of doing that. After six months, he was getting a bit more relief. After a year, he had no pain. <coughs> so he, he literally <coughs> trained his pain, his brain, to not feel pain. But as you can imagine, it, it was a lot of hard work and discipline to do that. A lot of mental effort. <coughs> and not, not something that all of us would be probably really motivated enough or disciplined enough to do. So that's where the bottom-up strategies come in. They're a lot easier and they're a lot more immediate. This is not to dismiss top-down strategies, it's just to point out that there's a, there are other pathways into the brain. And the pathways are, are easier and quicker. So, the bottom -up, so I'm going to show you three bottom-up strategies. Uh, one involving uh, vision, one involving touch, and one involving sound. Oh, sorry. One, in, one involving touch, uh, exercise, and you know, one involving um, body stimulation or auditory or visual. So again, touch is not not <coughs> meant in the way you would think of normal touch. I mean, we've all we've all been comforted when we're in pain by someone rubbing our arm or giving us a hug, but that's not what I meant here. When a person, it, when you're in pain, and if you have pain on one or the other side of your body, that is being processed by the opposite side of your brain. 
So if you, if you have what's called unilateral pain, and your left-hand side is being actually processed by the right side of your somatosensory cortex, and vice versa. So, um, one way of using touch to turn off pain signals is to touch the exact opposite side of the body and the location of the chronic pain. And that sends a signal through the somatosensory cortex that changes the pain signal in that, in that part of the brain. Um, so, knowing what we know about the brain gives us new ways of turning off pain. The touch has to be on the exact same location and it has to be um, of sufficient intensity to be noticeable, but, but not too hard. And that, the re repeated use of that will, ch will change the pain memory. The pe my patients that I do that with get hours of relief. And they find that when the pain comes back, it's often not as intense as it was before we did it. And it's something you can, you can get your partner to do. It's, it's, it's safe and there are no side effects, unlike many, many medications. There are other forms of touch um, but there, there isn't really time tonight to talk about them. Um, they're, they're all described in my book, which I'll talk about a bit later. Okay, talking about exercise. Obviously, um, um, exercise is very good for your brain, it's, it's not only good for your health. Exercise changes some of those biochemical problems. It increases serotonin and dopamine, which helps with your mood and with your sleep. Exercises stimulates increased BDNF, that's that brain growth factor that I was talking about earlier. Um, exercise helps restore some of the lost brain matter in the brain. So a lot of people who exercise regularly get improved cognitive function as a byproduct. And of course it helps with your heart and it leads to reduced anxiety and depression. So it's really something that's worth thinking about if you have health problems or chronic pain, if you, if you can, to the extent that you can. Right, so now I want to talk about a thing called bilateral stimulation. And I'm only taking a selection of strategies here, but this is a new strategy that I've been researching and um, has a great capacity to change how you feel relatively simply and relatively easy. So bilateral stimulation consists of visual or auditory um, left-right stimulus. It could be uh, a moving hand for a visual, or it could be tones for auditory stimulation. <coughs> just what's depicted there. And bilateral stimulation, because it's an external stimuli, tends to be a more attention-grabbing than some of those top-down internal stimuli that I was talking about earlier. Um, secondly, because it's bilateral, that is, it's moving backwards and forwards, it's not stationary, that also adds to the gain in terms of your brain paying attention. Because uh, the part of the brain that detects sensory input is basically 40,000 years old. And whenever we see or hear or detect something moving in our environment, that's going to get your brain's attention. Even though you know what it is. It's part of, it's what's called the origin response. So if, if you hear a bang outside the room, you would, would all go, what was that? Your, your brain is programmed to pay attention to external environmental stimuli, especially moving stimuli, because 40,000 years ago, <coughs> was that rustling in the grass, the wind, or a tiger coming to get you? Right? So if you, if you add bilateral stimulation plus focused attention, when you're in pain or when you're upset about something, that does two things. It holds your attention. And once your brain has worked out that it's not a saber-toothed tiger, it stimulates a relaxation response. And that happens <coughs> fairly quickly and fairly automatically in your brain. And that, and that leads to a new memory. And the same way that you experience that, but in a controlled way. 
because the relaxation that you experience <coughs> in response to the body upward stimulation becomes a part of whatever you're experiencing or having in your mind or remembering at the time you experienced the bilateral stimulation. It's, it becomes a new experience. Because normally, when we're anxious, when we're depressed, when we're in chronic pain, we experience those things in a fairly routine ways. Bilateral stimulation disrupts our experience of pain in the present moment. So, this is, so in, in terms of brain activity, you've got the brain activity associated with pain or stress, you've got, you've got the bilateral stimulation, and there's, a, there's initially a, a, an increase in brain activity as your brain's trying to figure out what's going on, and then once it realises it's not a threat, uh, the brain activity is decreased. And um, whatever distress you're feeling at the time goes with it. Okay, just by tuning in to your brain's sensory processing capabilities. So bilateral stimulation um, is a treatment element of a method called <coughs> EMDR. Or, has anyone heard of that? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It was discovered by accident about 20 years ago by an American a uh, psychologist called Francine Shapiro and she was walking in a park one day having some distressing emotions and she experienced some bursts of, of spontaneous saccharic eye movements so her eyes started fluttering rapidly and she noticed that after that she felt calm and then when she tried to think of the thing that she'd been upset about she no longer felt upset about it she, she started experimenting with some friends and with some Vietnam veterans stimulating eye movements while they thought of uh, upsetting memories or traumatic memories and found the same effect. So she called it eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And uh, it rapidly became uh, an, you know, an internationally accepted treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. It's an eight-phase treatment process which I'm not going to go through here. But just to say that it's much more than the bilateral stimulation that I've been talking about. And, and if you went to an EMDR therapist to go through this uh, full workup of, of treatment and assessment. Um, the, the thing about EMDR therapy is that it, it has quite a physiological impact compared with some traditional um, modalities. So, Typically following EMDR, our recipients report uh, feeling uh, less tense physically, quite dramatically so, uh, decreased emotional distress, decreased intensity of distressing memories, both the seman um, semantic and the procedural component of the memories. So they often report that the memory feels further away. Because when you um, when you feel upset about something, it feels very um, up close and personal because of the emotional arousal that's associated with it. But as you know, when something no longer is upsetting, it, it sort of seems more in the past. And that's called a distancing effect. And that's what EMDR stimulates. It also stimulates decreased activity <coughs> in the worry circuit, which I talked about earlier. Uh, feelings of calmness, uh, feeling more present. So when, when when you've got a problem that you can't solve, it's like you've got a monkey on your back. You can never really relax or be fully present. That thing is, is always there, interrupting your enjoyment of the present moment. So after EMDR and the pain of the trauma is, is reduced, there's an ability to be more connected to oneself in the present, in one's body and in one's environment. And your beliefs about your ability to cope and yourself become more positive as a result of those sensory changes. So an EMDR, the complete, or part of one of the completions of the process, is to install what's called a positive cognition, which is a belief that you can cope, that you're a worthwhile person, as opposed to uh, from the feelings of helplessness and worthlessness that are associated with being the victim of um, mm -hmm. trauma or pain. <coughs> and again, EMDR has been found to stimulate changes in all of the areas of the brain, um, 
associated with pain and uh, similar to meditation, except a lot quicker and with a lot less effort. So as I may have sort of indicated, there are various theories about how EMDA works to change pain, but one theory is that it um, sort of separates the emotional component of pain from uh, the actually felt component of pain. And that um, makes it less scary and less stressful and changes the way you experience it. So as I said, um, EMDA is an eight phase process, but what, uh, and you can't, you can't do all that by yourself, but you can do the, this, these two components here, the bilateral stimulation, and the focused attention. And what I've done in my book and in my system is to take out an element of EMDR, much as you might take uh, elements of uh, other approaches such as cognitive behaviour therapy, such as mindfulness, and do it on your own, but you wouldn't say that was the whole treatment as part of other things. Um, it's quite safe unless you, know, you suffer from some other sort of major psychiatric condition then you really shouldn't do it without consulting a doctor or psychiatrist. But for most people it's safe. So I'm going to um, just describe um, a, uh, a lady who used this component of my system to, to manage her carpal tunnel syndrome. She wasn't a patient of mine, she's an acquaintance of mine. And she, uh, this woman has had other health problems. She lost a lung due to cancer. And she was on a lot of medication, uh, really just, um, and she was working trying to keep going despite having carpal tunnel syndrome. And um, when I met her, she was really, she was basically going to have surgery, have to have surgery if things didn't get back better soon. And she really didn't want to have surgery. So, I made, an, I, have, I made an app, some of you have found it there, the details out the front, called Anxiety Release. Not, a, not actually a chronic pain app, but it, contain, it contains that bilateral stimulation component of EMDR because I found it very good for treatment of anxiety and um, I thought it would be good to develop an app for anxiety. Now it just so happens that carpal tunnel syndrome is also a condition that has, often involves anxiety. A high level of anxiety there. So anyway, I gave this lady my app. Nothing to She had no other treatment room for myself, and she went away for three months just using, just listening to the app whenever she was in pain. <coughs> After three months, she was pain free. She was off all medications, and she no longer needed surgery. So those those are just the uh, 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 sort of results of this gave some questionnaires for pain and depression and, and stress and uh, those are the results the researcher loves to see. So the down the blinds are all to do with the pain and the depression and the disability and the upward line is to do with her, her ability, her belief in her ability to control her pain. So it, it, you know, she believed, totally believed in her ability to control her pain. Um, now I'm showing this to you, I'm not saying that Everyone's going to get that result because everyone's pain is different and everyone's uh, pain is, is maintained by many different factors. But this, it's just to give you an example of, of what is possible. Um, I published a paper based on that lady's um, experience and it is, to my best of my knowledge, the first and only scientific report of, of an app being used to manage chronic pain that actually change the pain. So there are lots of apps for chronic pain, but a lot of them about tracking the pain and managing your mood and things like that. This, <coughs> this, this uh, has actually resulted in you know, someone having uh, losing their pain as a result of that. So putting it all together, uh, the system I've developed is a it looks at chronic pain not just as a pain problem, but as a, a problem that involves multiple elements. Um, 
the, the, and the, there are seven tasks or challenges that any chronic pain sufferer is faced with. The first one is to tame the pain. And uh, with, the, with the strategies in my system, I try to develop strategies that help you to do that without medication. This is not traditionally something that um, has been a goal of psychological pain management. It hasn't been regarded as possible. <coughs> but that was before neuroplasticity. The second task of uh, pain management is regulating emotions. The most chronic pain sufferers are <coughs> they're having uh, mood fluctuations and uh, they're emotionally there's a sense of instability. It's very difficult to regulate their mood. And uh, the third task is trauma processes. And so where the pain uh, might be based on or associated with past trauma, it could be medical mismanagement or mishaps, it could be other uh, traumas that they have set, suffered in their life, those have to be resolved as part of managing the pain. And often, often where I've used EMDR for treating someone who's had uh, a trauma and the pain is part of that trauma, uh, for example, phantom limb pain, and it's been possible to get a very strong result, similar to the case reported, by processing the trauma, because the pain is actually part of the traumatic memory. So, um, you know, I haven't got time to explain it, to describe more cases, but if anyone's interested, I'm happy to do that. Another very important task for chronic pain sufferers is self-care. Um, as I mentioned earlier, many people are very other-centered, living their life for others, putting themselves out, <coughs> um, working too hard, and it, uh, not, really, not really paying enough attention to their own uh, needs, physical and uh, diet, etc. So self-care is about getting enough sleep, eating well, pacing yourself, having enough support, just uh, making sure you're eating the right foods, or just, just looking after oneself. And self-care is, is there because um, we're all told to exercise and diet and look after ourselves, but how many of us do? because we've got other priorities, or we're, we're not really emotionally right with ourselves. So, so you can't do self-care until you've done the emotional work first. So you can see how the system follows the brain in terms of how you learn and how you apply yourself to things. It, it would be no good staying with self-care because if you haven't done that stuff, it's not going to, it's too hard. Alright? Then as we move up the brain, now moving towards the top of the brain and top-down strategies, um, you come to uncovering the meaning of the pain. So for every chronic pain sufferer, pain has changed their life, it's changed their identity. You're not the same person, uh, you, you know, you are at the end of chronic pain than you were at the beginning. Because it changes your goals, it changes how you move, it changes how you relate, it changes even your ability to play with your grandchildren or have hobbies. So uh, one, you have, at some point you have to deal and are dealing with how it's um, impacted upon your life and what it means for you personally. And, um, that's, that's again another aspect of pain that's not just physical. A lot of chronic pain sufferers also, there's a lot of other stresses going on in their life associated with perhaps the effects of their pain and its effects on their ability to work and have control over their life and achieve their normal goals. So, some of those other effects of pain have to be dealt with. It might be medical <coughs> problems, um, but it's very hard to focus on oneself and looking after oneself and managing pain if one is you know, in a very stressful situation. And lastly, reintegration. So that refers to um, getting a, um, developing a new identity, a new sense of self that's sort of post-pain, it's integrating the changes that have happened, but um, it's acknowledging that you are a different person, maybe not as, not as fast or as nimble as that person who was before they had chronic pain, but still someone who's capable of being a citizen in the world and achieving certain things, and who, who can feel good about themselves as they are, not, not a failure because they can't do the things they used to be able to do. 
And these are things, these, these, some of these things are things that don't always get talked about very much for chronic pain sufferers. There's a lot of, tends to be a lot of focus on the pain and the treatment. Okay, so there, there, um, so the system involves 15 pain control strategies. Um, uh, one, two, three, eight bottom up and seven top down. And you start with the bottom up and move to the top, to the top down, just to make it easier on yourself. The, uh, the, the system comes with 15 audio downloads, uh, um, which is designed to help give you sensory experience to change your brain, change your pain. Beginning with um, uh, uh, an exercise called skin, which teaches you actually how to increase your receptivity to sensory input by just tuning in to what it feels like to be touched. Some, uh, and some touch exercises, uh, the head hold, the uh, healing touch, the contralateral stimulation, which I talked about a bit earlier. And then there are four bilateral stimulation audio downloads designed to help stimulate pain relief to develop healing resources based on the pain relief that you've experienced from the bilateral stimulation. So when you feel relaxed, um, everyone's relaxation is different. Some will describe it as uh, the feeling of you know, the pain is maybe they imagine it as a red ball shrinking or maybe they imagine it as a fluid draining away. And the idea of developing a healing resource is that you link an image to the sensory changes that you experience from the bilateral stimulation. Rather than trying to imagine a healing light or an anesthetic mist or something that might sound lovely, but it's really just a figment of your imagination and has no, no grounding in sensory experience. Um, there's also a download which involves um, linking the bilateral stimulation with a piece of music. It's actually a piece called Care de Lune. It's a piano piece, which is a very relaxing piece of music. And the, the coupling of that with the bilateral stimulation just enhances your brain's ability to respond to music, that particular piece of music, because of the way it focuses your attention. So mostly when you listen to a piece of music, especially a familiar piece of music, you're only really listening to the first few bars, and then your brain is replaying what it remembers and you're off the pixies. Whereas when you listen to it by the stimulation, you, you, uh, you listen to, you hear every note, and you experience every note, it enhances your experience. And then there's a track that's pure bilateral stimulation, which, like the lady with the app, you can use just to stimulate feelings of relaxation and relief. And then there are seven uh, top-down uh, audio downloads, which involve teaching um, some of those more traditional strategies, such as mindfulness, meditation, breath awareness, how to have <coughs> positive memories, change how you feel, guided imagery. Uh, an exercise called attentional telescope, which <coughs> um, basically helps you move backwards and forwards between focused attention and global attention. So when you're anxious or stressed, you, your attention tends to be very narrowly focused, and all you can see is the problem. You can't see the wood of the trees. So that exercise shows you how to draw your, your attention back from the problem and to see the big picture, and often see resources or possibilities that hadn't occurred to you when you were feeling overwhelmed by the problem. Uh, another, and the last two exercises is to do um, developing a positive relief um, for believing that you're worthwhile being helped by others. For people who perhaps feel that they shouldn't, it's not okay to ask for help, they should be able to do it all by themselves. And a safe place exercise for people who have um, anxiety or stress or don't feel safe in the world. In addition, the program includes, four, there are 40 specific activities linked to each of the brain activities in each of the seven steps. So, I haven't got time to go through them all now, but um, it gives you things to do, for example, like um, recognizing stresses and creative visualization, changing your focus, uh, living mindfully, but it shows you how they link into uh, your brain functioning and how they link into whatever goal you need to deal with with your stress and your pain. So to summarise, 
never just put up with pain. You can change your brain, change your pain to the extent that it's in your brain. You just you need to stop at a side and rest if there's a problem you need to focus on, whether it's the pain or some other aspect of what's going on. Choose the brain strategies that suit your needs and base apply them and then base the new learning on the sensory changes that you're able to experience. And um, I'm launching tonight uh, <coughs> my book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Pain, which some of you may have heard me talk about yesterday on 3 Triple R, which contains the program and uh, how to access the 15 audio download. Thank you very much. You're talking about the HPA axis, the stress response? Yes. Yeah. Well, the, the, um, the stress response would be part of procedural memory because it's, and the, to the extent that well, it's being activated by stress and by a memory. So if, you, if you're um, being mugged, then that's not a memory because it's the first time it's happened. But if you have memories of being mugged, and every time you remember being mugged, your stress response is getting activated then that will be what we would call part of procedural memory because um, it's involved in bodily arousal rather than just thinking of being mad. Does that make sense? So yes, it does. Because so it's almost like a whole body response or part of that. Yes, yeah. And, and that's, that's, what, that's really what the challenge of changing pain is. It's a body memory part that we need help with. One more. Two more questions. You mentioned, I think, that the brain can shrink yes. with anxiety and various yes. things. Can it expand again? Yes. Um, the the grey matter that you lose <coughs> when you have chronic pain comes back after treatment. Uh -huh. So and so that's the only. It's the it is one good bit of news. It's reversible. Yes. One one more question. No. Yeah. Yes, one here. Yeah. Um, it's a big question, but um, you were saying that the MDR um, helps with the increase in beliefs and self worth and related to how does it work? Oh, sorry, yes. Um, so I said, I said that the EMDR helps um, people to believe they can cope better by um, changing the emotional response to the problem. So, um, for example, the lady who had, who used, who, no, that's, that's the, uh, um, if you came on with chronic pain and I treated you with EMDR and you learned, you would come in, you would come in feeling helpless, feeling like a failure, perhaps feeling worthless, and feeling unable to cope. That would be how you, how you saw yourself. And then following the EMDR, you get some control over your pain, you can reduce it, you, um, experience this pain as a result of that and you know there's something you can do independently when you're in pain, then that belief about yourself is going to change from I'm hopeless to I can do something about it, I can cope. But it's going to happen organically rather than trying to force yourself to believe that, which doesn't work. Thank you very much for your time and for coming. Books out the front, please.